um, training in those spaces Monday through Friday, uh, we rotate in different exercises like we, like we do currently. So when we examine our, our capabilities and our footprint at um, Camp Grayling, um, and then looked at what we were lacking, some of the things that we were lacking that we need to train for is getting us that distance to stress those communications, to more realistic distances, looking at that electronic warfare footprint. And when you say electronic warfare, there, there's a lot of different elements to it. Um, as an example, this year, uh, an example of, 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 of that would be, how quick can we uh, identify a unit based on their RF signature? So RF signature is very passive. It means every time we carry our cell phones in our pocket, key up a radio, that's emitting an RF signature. Turning on your computer, that's emitting an RF signature. So how quick could we, we look at where, where units were based on that? And then how do we overcome that? Um, and then how do we show uh, an organization how quickly we can target them? So they might be, my branch is field artillery, that's what I'm trained in. You could be a really great field artillery unit, but if you could be targeted within two minutes based on your RF signature and have a swarm of drones flying over your head dropping ordnance, you're, you're doing something wrong. And how do you combat that? So, so creating, uh, we work with some technologies to create faints, faint arm signatures. So, so systems would, would book it, pick up, you know, the, 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 those types of things. We're looking at how, how else can we train and um, hide ourselves from those elements. How do we camouflage ourselves from space? You know, walking through the woods on the ground, soldiers in the past put on face paint, they, they camouflage where their surroundings are, but, but now you have a whole uh, different threat out there with, with space satellite capabilities. So, so how do we camouflage differently? How do we reduce our, our signature uh, from, from the heat of our bodies to our communication systems to our vehicles? So, so those are the things we're trying to get after is, is training a force. My job, of course, is to ensure that our, our, our military members are trained the best that they can for potential engagements. And so when I looked at those gaps, uh, we developed this, this plan, we think, um, through all of our processes, all the things that we've addressed, um, that, that all of our, our asks are low or minimal impact to the community. Uh, we think we can um, take care of those things we like most about Northern Michigan, including our recreational, the things that the, the people at the, po the post, where, where we all live and work, we enjoy too. We all hunt, fish, side-by-side -side rides, snowmobile on the trails. We do those same things and love the country for the same reasons you all do. So how can we protect those interests while also taking care of those, those men and women who raise their right hand and trying to get after our nation's challenges? So I'm here today to answer your questions. I know there's um, things that have been thrown out that, that simply are not true or things that are out there that certainly are exaggerated. Um, we believe that there's a very minimal um, footprint that you all will see uh, from a from a day to day environment. If you're out in the woods and you see soldiers walking around or out on their, their military version of side by sides, give them a wave, thank them for their service, uh, continue on kind of thing, and, and ask questions if you see them training. So that that's my hope in this whole endeavor. Um, we certainly depend on community support for everything that we do. Uh, we don't ever want to go back to how the Vietnam veterans were treated. Uh, we, we look forward to engaging our communities and having, and having that respect. So, so by all means, I'm here to answer any questions. I understand our ask is a big one. Otherwise, I wouldn't be going around to uh, numerous town halls with the, the poor DNR representative who's been tasked to follow me. Uh, but uh, I, I certainly appreciate it. And, and anything that comes up or future questions, uh, by all means, uh, we're opening this comment period throughout. This will be a long, lengthy process, and, and, I, and we're here to, to, to answer those questions or mitigate those, those, those risks. So those things that are most important to you, are there things that we can do with our ask that, that mitigates those types of concerns where we can still get after those challenges that are minimal in the face of your world? So with that being said, I probably talked too much. Okay, the board's going to ask some questions first, Colonel. Uh, you can sit down if you want. I just hate you looking at my back. It's <laughs> your best side. <laughs> there were some rumors that people are worried about if there can't be any live shells coming this way. No, none of the um, areas that we're asking for would have any live munitions. We're, I have plenty of tank trails, I have plenty of impact areas, I have plenty of live fire training areas. Uh, nothing that we're asking for expands that footprint. Now our current footprint, where we do those things, uh, our, our 40 complex where we drop the, 
the big bombs that you probably hear this way a little bit. Fix my health. Yeah, yeah those, those things um, will, will still happen. So, so I, I'm not re reducing or increasing that that type of, of training that we're doing. Uh, this is this is different. We're we're not looking for for any live fire uh, additions to what we're doing. And what about the water way? No, so that that has come up. It came up early on when we met with some of the angler groups. That was their biggest concern. We have areas that we can conduct uh, water training um, from areas of Lake Huron to to small areas on Lake Marguerite to areas that are currently in our training area. So so we were quick to add the buffer that was recommended to us from the DNR. Had 1,500 feet. That was just a number that was thrown out. Well, by the way, we won't be going down the Osceola River. Well, you know, I, yeah, we're, we're not planning on, on any trips down down the Osceola, and and I and I did. Uh, I'm not um, unaware of uh, this nap last northern strike where we had a unit float down the Man Sea, um, paddle down that river. What they did was legal. What they did was currently um, not within the agreements that we had signed. Uh, the DNR, from a legal perspective, said there was nothing wrong with what they did. However, it certainly wasn't the greatest timing for me uh, when we're looking to add this uh, this proposal along the waterways in, in our, our upcoming uh, asks. So it looks right now you're going to come over to Newman Road? I believe, yeah. I don't. You're going to come right down that main power line. But how far down the, our township there are you going to come? Do you know? It's going to be in the northwest corner of, of the township. It sticks in my head roughly 6,000 acres. Yeah, I got 4,000 in the county, but uh, it, 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 it doesn't come. It'd be up by the four corners, corners almost? Yeah, it yeah, goes up to the four corners, yes. All right. So you don't come, you don't come south of Newman? I would have to verify that. I don't have it committed to memory on exactly where it's at, but I can, I can get the board that information. So pretty much, the, I these air, which is your area, the yes. land up there pretty much is that? Okay. Yeah, I would. I don't think we're going past like Moon Lake or anything like that. Okay. So it would be that, like I said, that northwestern okay. corner. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, oh, yeah. I, I had some questions, but I think you pretty much answered um, what I had written down here. Well, you brought up an interesting thing uh, with the cyber work that you're going to be doing. We have lousy cell service here now. Will that interfere with <laughs> what we're no, we, we, what so, we do have? No, great, great question. And, and to get after the challenge of, challenges of that that you have now, um, outside of this discussion, I have been working with, with several um, um, partners who are looking at expanding. They, 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 there's some grants out there for rural areas to get Wi-Fi and some other stuff. There was one up in this area. There was a company actually um, just north of Lewiston um, who was who tried to get a grant. They, they, they were denied this first go around, but to, to bring that, that additional network uh, provided service at a very reasonable cost. And that's important to us too, um, so we can we can replicate some of those, those types of things. However, when we do any of that training within the spectrum, we have spectrum analyzers, individuals who are trained in managing the spectrum to ensure that we're not interfering with, with any of the public. So um, with that being said, um, or as an example, every time we use anything that, that works the spectrum, including our radios, we have to go through the FCC for approval, where we're using it, what bands and frequencies we're using, all that is, is, is approved ahead of time. So any of that stuff we do, um, no, we, we operate on a completely different band. And it's important, even from a military perspective, you see um, over in Eastern Europe right now, we, um, you know, the Ukrainians have to do uh, what they're doing. They have to be able to, to, to get inside the systems of, of their um, adversary there. Um, but they also, have to receive information, intelligence, and everything else from the populace, right? So, so they can't interfere with the cell phones because they, they need that that public support through those systems and the hospital systems and all the other stuff. So, as we're developing those things, we have to be uh, very cognizant that that's in our interest as well, wherever we potentially deploy. Okay. Is there a? Um, I, you know, I'm looking here and seeing kind of where you're going to be or where you're proposing to be um, in our township. I've only seen one map and it was not good at all. Is there a map available that you would show us? Yeah, the, the DNR is kind of the holder of the map. 
I would caution that it, it changes rapidly, and I don't want to get that with yeah, maps. It, so it, it's still obviously a draft map. So we do on our website have an interactive viewer. Um, depending upon computer capabilities, it's either user friendly or it's not. Uh, it's just the nature of, of our system. But I, I can get you a, a static map that would, you know, if you want just for this area, I could zoom it in and, and give you, you know, kind of where the boundaries are. Because otherwise, it is a very large map when you figure you're encompassing. You know, three hundred thousand acres, basically. Yeah, so it's tough to get in on the detail. If you can get that yep. email to me, I yep. appreciate it. I can get that. Yeah. You yep. talked about a buffer um, back from the river. Will you have any type of buffer from um, the few residential areas? Yeah, we we don't have desire of um, connecting to any right to somebody's right. on the edge of their backyard, right? That that. And we all appreciate it, but we yeah. don't <laughs> I understand that, and, and frankly, that doesn't necessarily help help what we're trying to. To do either, right? So, um, although that that acreage is blacked off in those chunks, depending on the, the maps, um, that, that's not in our, our interest either. So, having a buffer around property, it's absolutely something we've worked with the, the DNR with, with previous concerns at previous town halls. Good. Okay. Thank you. 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 Just I have one quick question. The property in question is that owned by the state right now, or is he not taking over any private land? No, it's all it's all state forest land that's currently under our ownership. There's no uh, seeking of any additional acreage from our standpoint or from the from the military. So it's currently public land. And, and to be clear, it'll remain public land and under the management of the DNR. So it won't be managed by Camp Grant. Okay. We're just asking to use it along with everybody else. So they'll still run it, they'll still manage it. Camp Grandley won't manage those lands. How often uh, do you think you'll be out doing the maneuvers? Like you have a like schedule or is it just Yep, great question. So so right now on our training we, we post, you know, weekly things that, of what we have training on. Uh, obviously it's our, our biggest exercises. So so Northern Strike in the summer, typically it's you know late July, August. Um, the last couple of years it's been August. Um, Winter, uh, although we haven't had that demand um, uh, coming this way for winter too much, minus aircraft, I guess, uh, but that doesn't affect the land specifically. Uh, but but uh, about three training rotations a year. And we're not looking at expanding the size of Northern Strike. Right around that 8,000, 9,000 is our max capacity anyway. Uh, so, so we are looking at not growing for, for a larger, footprint during those training. So in actuality, you'll, you'll see the military footprint water down a little bit with the additional training areas because it's the same amount of troops. Okay. Anything else in the water? Okay, up to the audience, raise your hand and when you stand, give your name and your address, please. Start over here. Patrick Weil, 5661 uh, Vacation Land, Lewiston. Um, one thing we hear about in the public, but I just want to hear firsthand, is there going to be any kind of environmental impact? Uh, there's going to be a forest destruction. Um, I'm not sure what kind of maneuvers you're looking at doing, equipment to bring it in. So my question is just, what's going to be the impact of the current environment? So with the current agreements that we have, um, we have what we call a short-term lease land, which is what this would be put into. It's a short-term agreement short term being 20 years. Um, with that, we have a laundry list of things they can and can't, cannot do. So for example, no track vehicles are allowed. Um, they have to maintain to existing roads. They can't build new roads. They can't just, you know, start plowing up or things like that. So, you know, from, from that perspective, uh, we look at that as, as being fairly minimal. Um, I would say our forest management activities, which will continue across the landscape, would have more of a landscape impact than what the military does um, when, you, when you look at the removal and, and the visual aspect of it. So, um, and that's, that's where we have that ability to uh, take things. We, we, that 20-year uh, lease is reviewed annually. We sit down and go over concerns or issues that we have come, that have come up, and we have the ability to amend it if needed. If there's something that we need to add to it because there's an issue, then we can do that. And the, the short term came in in 1985, so we're on probably our third iteration of, of renewals, and, and that has been tweaked. Uh, it's getting more restrictive, 
uh, for things that have popped up and, and you know we're trying to, to mitigate those impacts. And, and that's one of the few advantages, you know, I'm, I'm, our, our ask is a lot. Um, and, and, and that's part of the map. Anything that we can consider a training area on, on that map allows us to bring in some, some federal resources. Again, um, it's certainly not the, the focus, but any of those areas, uh, we also have an environmental staff. They work closely with the DNR, uh, especially on any invasive species, sensitive habitats, uh, working with other partners um, to, to help out the environment with that stuff. So, so we do that regularly, working with the DNR. That's the, a little bit of resources. In addition, I can provide resources to those, those trails or, or, or roadways within those training areas. So I can't touch it, you know, the, the Page County roads and that type of stuff, but um, snowmobile trails and, and some of those side-by-side -side trails, those are things we could potentially help out with within those training areas. Can you make it easy? I'm going to start with the back row and work our way up. Yes. Um, I'm Debbie Dawson. I live um, down the state a little bit. Um, I've been meeting to come to a QA. and um, a I'm wondering what criteria the DNR is um, considering in their decision of whether or not to approve the camp grazing expansion proposal um, because it's not the director of DNR's approval. Um, is there any, um, do you have any information as to what that criteria might be? I don't. Um, that is a, a popular question that, you know, the, the decision for uh, this process and any large or any land transaction with the state falls with the director of the DNR. So, you know, it will be, uh, we'll provide him with all the comments that we get when he says, all right, I want to pull from this, this, this set and we'll continue the comments as we move forward. And it's going to be looking at, at those reviews. It's going to be, you know, everything that he has at his disposal. I'm not privy to what his decision-making process is going to be. Um, I wish I could give you a, a, an insight to that, but I can't. Um, so I apologize for that. But to give you an idea, so, you know, this is, it's 162,000 acres was their original ask. And I'll guarantee it won't be 162,000 acres if it ever gets to a decision of moving forward. Um, goes back to the environmental aspect. We will be looking at uh, the, every parcel that's being asked for, we'll go through a review. And we'll, we'll take, take into consideration those sensitive habitats, the, the environment, or the, the endangered species, the, the wetlands, and, and things that are compatible and not compatible with the type of training that they're looking at. We have a pretty good baseline with what they've done in the past, and we can, we can build off of that. But that will start to pare down. And that's what we're at right now. We're still in the public phase comment for this process. The director has not made a decision on do we go to phase two. So if you think of this in several phases, we're at one right now, public comment. Um, as the colonel mentioned earlier, we will take public comment through the whole process. If the director decides we're done, we're not gonna entertain it anymore, public comment ends. Um, if he decides we go to phase two and we start that environmental review process, then we'll continue to take the public comment until, like I said, we're done. So, you know, our, our big work really from the environmental side of things is yet to come. Uh, we will dive into that once we get that nod from the, from the director. Parallel to what we do, once we pare it down to what we are comfortable with saying, yep, we feel this is compatible with what they're asking, whether it's, you know, five acres or whether it's 100,000 acres, the military has to do their own NEPA evaluation as well. That's a federal requirement. And that will be subject to, to public comment and public review as well. So there'll be two different in, uh, reviews of this going on. It'll be ours from our side. We'll have all of our partners look into it. You know, it's not just the forestry division. We are the land administering division, but we're not the only manager of the property. We'll, we'll get input from Parks and Rec, from Fisheries, from Wildlife, uh, from the Michigan Natural Features Inventory Group, which is our, our contractors for these sensitive areas. So, I'm sorry for sharing that for you. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of gives you a snapshot of what we're looking at. This will be a lengthy process. Um, I've kind of thrown it out there. I don't see anything happening on the ground if it gets that far until 2024. Um, so that it will take time to go through this. Uh, we will make sure we do our due diligence and, you know, we take very seriously what our mission is to, to protect the resource, manage the resource uh, for, the, for the generations to come. And, and that's how all this figures in. So it's, a, it's an evaluation that we do, whether it's the military asking, whether it's a group of Jeep uh, clubs that want to come up and ride, whether it's oil and gas exploration. We do this full type of review for anybody that's looking to do 
uh, any type of activities on our property to ensure that they're doing what we want them to do and they fit within that mission. And that allows us to build those parameters on a permit or in this case, a, a management agreement. So, yeah. I just want to follow up and just like, I, I'm confused on like how uh, public comment um, uh, process works when the person making the decision isn't at the Q&As or in these meetings. Um, well, it's, you know, the, the majority of the comments are coming in via our internet, our, our interactive viewer, through emails, through letters to the director. So, you know, we, we had one uh, public forum that was hosted by the DNR. There was roughly, I don't know, 200, 250 people at that meeting. And, you know, that's, that's what we're employed for. I, I've been tagged, as the Colonel said, as, as his representative to funnel that information to him. This is typical of all the decisions that we have that go through a major public review comment. Um, think about the, the ORVs and, and Public Act 288 that came out that either allows a road to be open to ORVs or shut down to ORVs. It's the same process. It goes through a public review process. All that information is disseminated to the director and the director decides whether or not what roads or if he's good with the recommendations that are being put forward. Um, you know, and. and it, whether it's the best process out there, that's, I'll leave that for your, your decision, but that's a process that we have, so. Okay, now we only got this for an hour. That's what we told the Colonel we have, so let's try to have just one thing going on. And next question, right in the back, Orange. Yeah. Scott Lucas, Lewiston. Uh, what's that gonna do to our property values? Is it gonna lower our property values or is it gonna go up? What, the way I see it, it's just gonna go down. It's, it's not a good thing. You know, I can, you know, again, that's that's a, a big question. We have the same concern when we come up and clear cut next to someone's property. Um, you know, Crawford County and, and the township, Grayling Township, uh, I can't say whether they've seen a, a, a drop off on the property value since Camp Grayling's been there. I mean, you figure they've been training there since 1913, and obviously you can say I doubt the property values have gone down during that time because everything's appreciated so much. Um, we don't have any studies. Uh, there's a Camp Grayling Community Council, and they are, we are going to be putting in a request with NEMCOG to look at an economic study. Uh, for the future. But I can say for myself, I live adjacent to a, a mile by mile Kirtland Warbler clear cut that I put up. And I also live next to the military train and my property values, my taxes have gone up every year. I'm not, for personally, I mean, I'm not seeing an impact to that. That's, that's one person. Um, but you know, that's one of the things that, that we look at is, you know, is there gonna be a, a devaluing? And, and right now we just haven't seen anything. Um, I can't say that yes or no, I don't know what the economy is gonna do. I would say that's probably gonna be more of a driving force um, than what's going on. The areas, you know, the, the areas I think that would be the most severely impacted are the areas that are already there. When you have the 30 and the 40 complex where we have live fire, we have the bombs dropping, that's being impacted the most severely. Guthrie Lakes, which is just, a, I could throw a baseball from their houses to the range. Um, those values there, they're the ones that have the most significant impacts. These short-term lease lands that are out on the fringes, I, 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 you know, I can't say that it couldn't happen, but I, I don't foresee that as being uh, an issue. Thank you. Next question. So, so right now, the, the current lease is the only lease language that we have that is available. Um, there is no drafted language for the expansion because we haven't gotten to that point. So um, this is very much a, a work in progress and, and we're going at the steps of what the director provides his approval on. And, and so we're not putting the cart before the horse. Uh, when we get to the point, if we get to the point of doing lease language, 
there will be that will be subject to public comment and public review. So uh, if we get that far, we'll go through the same process. And, and frankly, that's kind of what's important too. These these, these town halls and, and other comments, from from my perspective, right? So so I already explained my mission, um, but we're you know we've, we've identified the, the the property owners' concerns. Those aren't our our areas of interest either. Paying you know right next to these property. Um, and, and we talk about the waterways. So, to, from my seat, those are the most valuable comments because those are things then that I can take back and and and, and when we, we talk with the DNR and, and look at those those areas. Those are things we can put uh, from from our agreement. You know, hey, we, we can we can do that. That's not what we're trying to get after. Uh, it allows that lease language. So we'll we'll start, I believe, like like Tom said, with the draft of the short term lease stuff. And then there'll be other stuff they'll have to add. Just like annually, if um, a criminal order is an example, uh, it, area is sound, and then that limits our, our ability. Uh, we find new nesting sites for eagles. Well, then, then we, we put a buffer around those areas regularly. So all those things happen within our, our training areas um, currently. So when we, we see those things, when, we, when those things happen, those are those discussions that we regularly have with our environmental staff, the town's folks, and then with the upgrades to, to lease languages, if you will. So this is that time, and then that will help drive some of our, our lease language uh, discussion later if we get to that point after they do their, their whole plan study. Next question. Chuck Post from Freedom Township President. I got a question for you, Carl. With the, obtaining this property and everything else, I'm part of believer in the barter system. We're giving up uh, the property and that to increase the size of that. The biggest problem that we have in rural America around here is the internet service and the cell phone service. If we're giving up this area and that, the concerns, could we not have the federal government assist us in the areas that are impacted by Camp Grayling to give us this service? as part of the deal? I mean, it might be a little res more receptive of the communities to, to be able to have to ascertain some of this as, as a benefit for us, because then that would also help us to develop for technology companies and smaller businesses that want to start up in the area, which is it's, it's the biggest block is not having internet service and good cell phone reception. I mean, I think we can work something out here, and I think a uh, presentation like that would be a little more receptive to the citizens of the area as a trade-off. Yes, sir, I won't make a promise for you today, but I wrote down your note. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Next question. Um, yes. Um, like cell phone jammers and screen rings to ensure cell phone service. And if you're saying that you are going to be doing this like surveillance technology on this land, is it permitted by your system to, to be, be using that, which could impact um, people's like cell phone and internet around here negatively? Um, so that's like one concern that I had. Another concern that I had was PFAS. You know, PFAS is a forever, forever chemical. Fishing is like really important to a lot of people in this area. And I think that um, you know, PFAS spills uh, can can impact fishing for for decades. It's a forever chemical. You know, in the Huron River right now in Michigan, um, there's a 25 year adult fish in that river because of PFAS. And you all have a history of PFAS spills. And now you want to use more water, like or PFAS contamination. Sorry. Um, so uh, those are two big concerns that I have with this increased um, land use to the, the, the best thing about this area, which is the, the natural beauty. Um, yeah, thank you. You didn't say where your address was. Oh, I'm from Detroit. So, um, cell phones, no, we don't, we don't jam cell phones. I, I already shut down immediately by the FCC if I was, I was jamming any, any um, personal cell phones. We, we don't do that uh, whatsoever in our training uh, up along our areas. And, and I'm not familiar with the scenery system that, that you mentioned. So, so I have not seen that in any of the training that we have conducted, nor is that, that part of our interest in what we're, we're looking at EW. As, as far as PFAS, um, uh, yes, the, the military 
uh, has used PFAS in their firefighting foam in the past. Uh, and, and I say PFAS, it, it was, it's the, um, oh shit, what's it called? What's the article called? It's the thermocol. No, the, the firefighting foam. And, and so the, the, only, the only place that we have used that is in that, that firefighting foam. Uh, you are seeing that throughout the entire state of Michigan, wherever they, they use that foam to put out fire. So they, they use it for, for vehicle fires on the side of the roads. They've used it, you know, can't come to the International Airport. Uh, did, did a lot of training, they're finding a lot of PFAS out there. We trained with it out at um, Camp Grayling Airfield. Uh, and then when they, the, the firefighters would come back to the base, they'd wash their fire trucks off at the base, and that's why we have the, the contamination, I believe, on the base. So, so that circular process with that PFAS is, is actively being studied, and we're actively working uh, for, for re re remediation potential solutions. Uh, does the military go out and train with PFAS if we're known? Uh, the only instance we use it is for that firefighting foam, which we are no longer permitted uh, to, to train with. However, in all those those other uh, civilian use airports, they still have the firefighting foam because that's the only thing that really puts out those types of fires right now. So they're looking at different reduced areas or different types of the PFAS or PFOA uh, that, that have less risk or, or not as forever as some of the chemicals that were, were used in the past. Uh, arguably, PFAS, PFOA, uh, was, was found in uh, everything, you know, including myself, uh, bought as customers. It, it's been in Gore-Tex, and they bought Gore-Tex boots, and Gore-Tex jackets, and Teflon pans, and Old McDonald's styrofoam wrappers, and all those things had that forever chemical in it. And so did the military also use it for their firefighting foam? We did. And so that's that's what we're in the, the process of looking up and trying to, of course, clean up. Uh, did we know in the past? No, we're training our firemen to respond to those, those emergencies when, when called at. But uh, even when you look back at the 70s and 80s, there were communities not too far from here uh, where they would spray the foam, put the nickel dimes, pennies and quarters out there, and let the kids play in the foam to find the, find the change. So, so clearly, uh, if there was a risk with that, that, that certainly wasn't determined in those time periods. So is it a problem? Yep. Is it something we're trying to, to get after if you out base to clean it up, especially at the, the airfield? And, um, and over at the main base there. Yep, those are things that we're actively engaging in, but that's not part of our normal training is, is spraying chemicals anywhere we've ever trained. That was specifically tied to the, the firefighting foam. Hope that answers your question. Yes, in the back. I'm Janet Lucas, I'm a uh, here in Lewiston, and my question is, of the current 147,000 acres, during the recent northern strike, how many of those acres are being used? So that's an interesting question. So, so not all of it is, is used all the time, right? So, and it's the same with our ask for these acres. So will we use every square inch of every acre simultaneously? Absolutely not. That, that, that's not what we're looking at doing. Um, what we do is we'll rotate units out. So think of a, a unit, 50 to 100 folks, 25 folks, 12, you know, soldiers out in the woods, set up for two to three days, and then they're moving on, and then and they have the ability to recon those areas, find those areas with those, excuse me, existing roads and trails, set up those those areas to train in, and then move out to, to you know, somewhere further away. So, so it's not all used simultaneously, and so sometimes I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I want to be as accurate as I can with you, but, but it depends. So, um, and, and, it'll, and the same with the future. We'll, we'll, every square pixel on those maps have soldiers in them every year. That answer is no, right? We're, we're, we're giving those opportunities, those units will come train, they'll be out in one area two or three days, they'll move and be out in another area, and so it won't be a congested population of those training sites. And it kind of says, then why the extra? Yeah. Like, exactly. Why the extra 162 or 16, yeah. whatever? Yeah, I get, I get that question, right? It's to give us, Give yeah, us that distance and those, those opportunities to train in right alongside the, where the public does right now. So even our other short-term lease is absolutely open to the public as well. Um, the units will go recon, they see campers in a particular area in the middle of the woods as an example, they, they won't occupy that space. They'll go in, and train in a, in a different area for two, three, four days, move on to the next one. And so it gives those different um, training opportunities versus an area that we would lock down for military training that would always be available. We, we, this is where we think we have that, that balance to protect what we all know about Northern Michigan and provide that recreational resource for everybody here, but also get after the, the training challenges that we have. Okay, and one other question, will there be corn 
concrete people here. Somewhere. Yeah, there, there, there is right now. So as an example for Northern Strait this, this past year, uh, we had um, several of our, our allied partners came with us. Um, the, 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 the Brits typically come up here every year. Canadians typically came here every year with us. Uh, the Latvians, you know, they have a much lesser footprint because, uh, you know, their president wanted to keep as many forces as he could on, on their area in Eastern Europe right now. But the Latvians uh, typically are here. Uh, Liberians from Africa typically come up and train every year. They're folks on different stuff. The more folks on medical type training and stuff for their concerns with Ebola and that type of thing. Um, but um, the Aussies, the Danes, um, all, all rotate in here for different exercises. So any given year, we'll have four to a dozen different um, allied partners that come. The, the Poles usually are here training with us. They are, are currently have a, a, a huge um, a migrant challenge, of course, from Ukraine, so, so they didn't come this year. Uh, but we'll have different countries for sure rotating training sites. The last thing we ever want to do is, is go and you know, and this is Scott Myers talking, not necessarily Colonel Myers talking, I guess, but I don't want to speak on behalf of, of, of the military. But uh, I don't necessarily want to go somewhere by myself. Or if if we can, you know, Ukraine is fighting that war with Ukrainians, and, and we're not there. And so if we can train those those forces to be better self-sustaining in those areas, or be ally partners, so when we do go with them, how we communicate with them, how we do those other things with them, that's, of course, for a their uniforms look a little bit different, but, but frankly, the community's been good to them too. I took a, a bunch of uh, um, Scots, and um, oh, uh, we had some Aussies with us. We went out to a, a, a breakfast location, and someone came up, came up and bought all of our breakfast and thanked everybody for their service, regardless if they were wearing the US flag or the British flag on their shoulder. So, so you'll actually see that. Thank you. You bet. Gentlemen, the register, if you have a question. Uh, Jeff Muckle, Lewiston. Uh, my question uh, goes back to your first statement, uh, brigade training. I'm not familiar with that term. And uh, if you say uh, a lot of live fire is not going to really expand beyond what is current. So you mentioned several other types of training. 230 miles and enough for that. Yes, sir. So to get at through your first question, brigade training, what we've been focused on in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, centric operations focus on that, that um, land size and brigade. So brigade represents 3,500 to 5,500 troops focused on a specific piece of ground. And now our challenge is how do we um, incorporate all those other domains versus just looking at uh, an army brigade formation going into a piece of, of ground in Iraq, for example, where the Air Force owned their space, the Navy, of course, owned the sea space. We didn't have um, cyber threats really at any of those times. So we still had some challenges, sure. Uh, we lost lives in those conflicts, so I don't want to um, you know, minimize those, those, um, those challenges that the military had. It was a completely different uh, type of environment. Um, no, and, and, and like I said, I, I wouldn't be coming to all the town halls or, or doing all the scrutiny um, if, if I didn't think it mattered and, and those challenges that we need to get up to those greater distances and replicate those, those greater distances to train in those challenges. So that's really what I focus on is how to give those training opportunities for those units, so small elements to move around, but, but also getting that greater distance to better replicate those, so those threats. So just like the, the lady before you, question, are we using every square inch of every acre that we have? The answer is no, but it, it's where that acreage is and, and how and how we can use those different pieces at different times. So so it's, um, if you look at the, the entirety of a map and look at all the acreages, even now, there are places, of course, during our major exercises, one year it won't get used at all, next year it may, it depends on those types of training formations that are, that are rotating. So what you're saying is that for this extra land, the footprint for these training exercises will be very small. Yeah, much, you know, our, our current footprint of those high impact areas, and, and we identify that is like um, a high impact area would be our bottom range over the 40 complex. Those will still exist. Those, those heavy 
uh, areas of, of a lot of troop formations, uh, a lot of what we call kinetic activity, meaning that live fire all happening simultaneously. Those, those things will, will still exist. These other areas are pushing those smaller formations out for that, that different type of training. So they get that training experience for a couple of days uh, for each type of unit. Now those, those types of units still have to eventually go in and train in that kinetic environment. So they still have to do their own line fire. They still have to do those things. I don't need more land for that. They'll rotate in and do that simultaneous piece of training. I'm trying to get out those greater distances to stress their, their communications and other time. Gentlemen. Yeah, John Norton, 27 Golf County Drive. I, I kind of like to understand the financial of it. We're calling it a lease. Normally with the lease, there's dollars exchanged for the use of that lease. From my understanding, there is no dollars being exchanged between the federal government and the Michigan DNR. That, that's a problem for me. You know, when you look at hunting and fishing and ATVing, and we all pay fees to use that land in our, in our permits to, you know, to hunt and ATV. The logging industry has to pay fees to, you know, to take up the uh, log. You're going to take the, our current DNR resources and spread them even thinner by having one more entity to police to make sure that you're living up to your end of the bargain as far as the lease would be written. So why wouldn't we charge the military to use this additional land? The, uh, the, the current lease, and, and again, if it goes back to what our process is for this type of, of venture. So the short-term lease has just over 42,000 acres of what we currently have on the books. Um, of that, the, the military reimburses the funds that purchase lands were, were uh, used, you know, so fishing game fund or uh, Pittman Roberts or some other fund that might have been used to purchase land to, for the state, that gets reimbursed uh, the taxes that we pay out to, to the municipalities. So any of the tax reverted land, which is the majority of the land that we have, uh, the treasury pays the built tax on that, the military doesn't uh, reimburse us, and it's the state national guard, so it's a state entity, the state entity. And even within, you know, if we have wildlife division do something, there's not money that changes because it's, you know, it's within that state entity. This isn't the federal government coming in and using it. So, you know, it, what will probably happen if this gets that far is it'll probably have the same type of framework. So of the 42,000 acres to finish that thought, it's like 2,100 acres is what's been purchased that wasn't tax reverted at that time. So that property, that 2,100 acres that's assessed uh, the, the non-swap tax, which would be the purchase land tax, that gets reimbursed into those funds from the military. We pay it out, the military pays us back that chunk of change. Some of it stays within our division, some of it goes to wildlife, wherever that fund is from. Is from. And that's what I would imagine the framework would be for this next one. What would that purchase land be? I don't know at this time frame. Uh, that will be another aspect of, of when we do the parcel review is, is pursing out, you know, the tax reverted land versus the non or the purchase lands. And that would be there, basically their their bill. Yeah, I, I guess what, what I'm saying is, <laughs> purchase land or not purchase land, the community has to pay a fee to use those lands, whether they're purchased or not purchased. And and those are that help pay for the trails, pay for the snowmobile trails, wh whatever it is. DNR officers to patrol the area. The DNR officer patrol is pretty low as it is. Mm -hmm. You know, with ATV snowmobiles, it, it seems to me that you're just going to spread those resources even thinner. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that the National Guard, even though it's a Michigan National Guard, when they bring other countries in for other states, you mentioned 29 other states that are in here, are you being, are they you charging those other states National Guard to use the facilities here? If not, why? So all I can charge is incremental cost recovery. So, so yes, we do charge. Um, uh, and, and, and if it's a portion of those lands, those training areas, yes, the, the portion that we have to have to, to pay out of the, the, the state of Michigan to the DNR for that, that, that gets calculated in you. So, um, as maybe a better example, um, an entity, uh, Michigan State University, or another um, you know, military or the police force wants to come training at, at Camp Grayling. Uh, you know, I've got a lot, of, a ton of law enforcement out there training right now. Um, they have to recover those, those federal costs. So when a, a building is built with federal dollars, um, that portion of the 
the, the electric, the, the, the gas, the recycling, the trash disposal, all that gets figured out in the calculation. And that's what I, what, what, what we can charge. We can't make um, revenue off of that. We can only um, recover costs associated with, with any type of activity on those on those areas of that are covered. Even the four countries? No, I, 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 don't, I don't, I can't make a revenue off of it. I have to charge them for what they're using, but I, I, can't, I can't make a, a profit at it. And then I just have to, I have to make everybody whole in that process, wherever that, that whatever the entity was used. Well, you're getting at then what we increase the cost of the DNR as part of that, maintaining that property. And that's, well, both of us too, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, Everything I've heard it says there's going to be no dollars. Yeah, that, from a, that, from that, a, that may or may not be true. From a Michigan DMA, the DMBA to the DNA, Michigan DNR, it's, you know, you're walking around, you're moving one pocket, money from one pocket to the other, it, it's managed by, you know, the, you know, the state and that, that aspect. Uh, any, any federal type stuff, utilizes the stuff they have to recover costs, but I can't, I can't. I'm not in business to make, make money off of campus. I can't do that. But you're recovering your cost. Yep. And I think my point is, is to recover the four of the DNR cost. Well, I'm not even sure that the money that we're spending on all of our trail permits and fishing permits is getting back into the DNR anyway. But well, you know, those those are very finite targeted areas where that goes to. So an ORV trail permit only goes to your ORVs and trails. So when Public Act 288 came out and it opened up all the forest roads, none of that money goes to the forest road maintenance. So by that being enacted that put a you know you talk about a burden on the on the forestry division that's a huge burden because now we have to come up with that money to pay for that the benefit uh, that i see with one of the benefits with the military is the lands that they currently have occupied or under our lease i can go and take them to help maintain those roads because they're using them too so you know it's, it's all very finite when you when you look at a lot of the users you know there's a there's a large user group that pays no fees that utilizes state land you know, and, and this is whatever the process is. I, I, I can't, you know, change it now, but that's just our process. So, you know, people do pay fees for trail use, but those are very specific on how those could be used back into that specific trail. It's not just, I can't go in and tap into the ORV fund to do uh, road work on a forest road, I guess is my point. So. Yes. Uh, what's the backup plan? The backup plan, from from my perspective, <coughs> we don't have a backup proposal for this plan. Um, and you mentioned Congress was the one that sought out areas to do this additional training. So, is there any idea of what uh, you know, maybe above you, what the plan might be? If Camp Bailey isn't selected, so I don't get to see all of those results. Certainly, um, recently, some areas have responded. Yet, there are some areas that. We're just out of contention because they, um, we have some large training areas, of course, out in the desert, right? So that, that's a very specific type of training um, that, can, that, that can happen there. Um, you, you have, um, I would say, the pine slide or RD stuff, white sands, Mr. Range is an example, or, or some of those, those expanses of desert uh, out in California, as an example. Um, they don't cover all those requirements for that, that all domain type of a training environment. So um, they're, this is ongoing, you know, we're, you know, everybody's looking and doing this analysis um, right now, certainly. Um, but um, knowing those bases, training, having training at many of them, uh, and, and what's currently there, um, there's not a lot of options from what I see. And just one more question. What is the plan to deal with uh, the disgruntled hunters that might be disrupted while they're out on their deer stands? Um, and, you know, some soldiers come off and well, for, for rifle season, it's kind of a national holiday for everybody at the camp as well. Um, so, so that would, they're, they're out hunting in those same woods. Um, and, and, and nobody really, we, we don't schedule much training during that, that time frame. Uh, however, um, just amongst all of our training lands right now, I think, you know, Brown's a big bird hunter behind me. I won't speak on his behalf. Um, some of his primary hunting is, I believe, on current military training areas. That's right. Am I speaking in react now? Kind of. I don't want to give up any of your hot spots. I don't want to tell you your 
Well, it's, it's, no, you know, it, it's it's another use. It's it's something that you know you could have the same. I I've, I've actually been out doing my job marking timber and walk right through the camp. You know, while they're set up. You know, it, it's it's another activity that's in the woods and. Uh, it's one that has been going on for you know a number of decades uh, currently on its current footprint and in my time with the DNR I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've had a phone call where someone's been upset because of the interactions between the two. Um, camp railing itself you know it becomes one huge deer camp during rifle season there are pop-up cities all over you would think they were training uh, because of that much like it does everywhere else and and you know most of their training, like the colonel said, uh, takes place during the summertime. They use very few days in, in the fall, and uh, you know that's that's just the part of the the coexistence of multiple users within the woods. Okay, we only got ten minutes left. I'm trying to get through everybody here, so I think there was a jump, lady. Great. No. No, I'm Brandy. Okay. Sorry. Brandy Curio, I'm a Greenwood Township. Um, property owner, and I'm on a couple of boards here with the township. First, I'd like to thank you for your service, and thank you both for coming. I feel as almost, this is like a double-edged sword, because if I say I don't want you training here, I'm saying I don't want you to train to potentially save my life. Does that make sense? So in that aspect, um, clearly nobody wants them in our backyard because of the noise, the fishing, hunting, so on and so forth. Can you tell me, if any, has there been any um, damage to personal property Vehicles and so on and so forth during your training here. Damage to first component. Um, the, the big, so the two years I've done the job, uh, a vehicle turned around in somebody's yard um, over by Jones Lake when they saw they weren't supposed to drive on that road because we had the military signs that said no military vehicles. And um, the, the soldier stopped, knocked on the door, said, Hey, I just broke out of your yard. We sent her out. Reseated at, uh, within the next day, uh, but but major damage to stuff during my tenure here, I have not seen any of that. Now, military's been training here for 100 right. years. Um, most of the complaints that I'll get, um, or, or that our community relations person will get, um, sometimes um, realtors don't do their their best disclosures, I guess, and um, they'll sell some properties in the fall up in Michigan or Duffy Lakes. And someone will come in and not realize they just bought a piece of property right by a very loud impact area. Right. And uh, as soon as summer comes back around, that's when I'll start getting those types of noise complaints. Those are probably our biggest complaint, or with military traffic on Jones Lake or uh, in the Duffy Duff 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 Lakes area. But that's been about, um, I, I would say, the only complaints. Uh, and we track every complaint in office. Um, so our community relations person uh, feeds every one of them to, to, to myself. So I can make sure that any, any complaints or, or anything with action uh, or, or response has been followed up. But, but major things since I've been here, the answer has been no. Now, 100 years? Right, I'm I know sure. you're getting I can imagine that. I can imagine that, right? So that's <coughs> not Thank you. And, and we take great care in that. And as soon as something comes up, um, nowadays with you know social media and everything else, you hear about it pretty quick. We right. usually, not directly first, it's usually put out for everybody in the brother group. Right. And, and that's good to know that to take care of it that quickly. Thank you. Uh, Ron Palmquist, Wayne administrator and resident here in Greenland. Um, you have non military commercial partners developed and you know, provide you with equipment, and I assume then training on that new equipment. Uh, is there ever a time when they would come into the, if this is approved? But they would come into the area without military presence, in other words, on their own, uh, without the supervision of the military. Not through us. So we do have industry partners work with us um, regularly. We, 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 we push for that so we can have those latest technologies around our service members while they're, while they're training. Um, from a, 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 an industry R&D they're not interested in just going out in the woods with their thing, right? They want to go to a range, they want to go into a fence area to protect, protect their proprietary information, they want to, you know, book our um, urban training area and all those things. We have to recover those costs with any, anybody that, that, that books or uses those things. So an industry partner is coming out to the woods 
Um, that, that's not, I, I have not seen any interest uh, ever with that. I, nor would I, that's just not their interest. Now, um, when our soldiers train in the woods, uh, they'll have new computer systems, different things. Um, there, there would be industry partners, like you mentioned, with them. Raytheon travels with, you know, um, the, the, the amphibious sevens when they're firing their artillery. And, and obviously that's not in these areas, but, but you would see potentially Raytheon there. Lockheed is worth the high mark, so the rocket folks, you know, they're looking at ways to improve their systems all the time, getting those soldier touch points. Uh, they'll come out for a couple of days whenever they're training alongside those folks. And so from that perspective, um, there, there, there would be, you know, you know, industry partners were fitting in and out with, with that aspect. Now, I don't know the rules with the DNR on any other state lands if industry is able to just go out in the woods, but, but I don't see any of that demand um, whatsoever. And you mentioned two drones. Would there be drones at all in this area? That very well could be localized drones. Um, we're, that's a big challenge for us right now and everything we're doing, not only from a drone sensor perspective that can, um, can spot where you're at, um, uh, pretty rapidly, but but even in in you know, foreign countries, can they can they drop an ordinance on you? So so we're we're looking at some drones, not necessarily for these areas, but certainly for some other areas. Um, and, and it m might be these areas where drones can drop tennis balls on the troops to just give them an effect that, hey, gotcha. I gotcha, I can see what you're doing. You're doing something wrong. It's so fast I can target you. We're not we're not doing that. Yet, but that's that's the the extent of that. Is how do you how do you uh, train in that type of environment? Because they're, they're everywhere right now. Thank you. Yes, sir. One more question. Anybody got a question? Yes. Hi, Colonel Lawrence. My name's Tom. I'm here in Greenwood Township. Um, thank you for your service. Those of us who live up here love and support our military. You keep saying it's not in our interest now to do live fire, but what happens in a couple of years if your interests change? Will then we end up with live fire in these areas? I don't, it's, I say that because I can't, and um, anything that we're, we're looking at, and we're obviously um, do, do strategic looks on, on things, there's nothing that I see that, that would be in that ask. Now, um, anything like that would have to come up with a whole different DNR analysis, right? Because um, to put it in, in an example, all that, that short term release that we currently have, we haven't been able to live fire in any of those areas. You have not changed that since 1985, right? So, so we have not asked for uh, any of those areas, nor have as have we even approached the DNR about live fire activities. And we've had those 44,000 acre agreements with the DNR since 1985. So it would be in the lease. It would be time. in the lease. Yeah, yeah, and you know the, the lease agreements, regardless of whether it's a short term or a long term, do not allow for permanent uh, installations or permanent structures or fencing. So. Um, no outside public, public safety. So, you know, those types of things, that's why it's in a different lease. The long term, they, the primary for, for the military is training for us. Um, the short term, we have all, overall authority. So, anything that they want to do, even if they want to, you know, have a little bit of a clearing, they have to put it through us to get an approval. And, and you know, I, that's where I come in and I weigh, is it really beneficial? If it doesn't make sense, I say no. Um, so, that is part of the process, and that is part of the lease agreement is that, that stuff is not allowed. Thank you. Colonel okay. Scott, thank you, thank you for coming. Give me your opinion today and answer everybody's question. Again, I'd like to thank you for your service. And Tom, I'd like to thank you for coming from the DNR. I know you guys are going through a lot. This, this was a Things pop up. Yep. We're getting closer, just keep going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.